Bibliophiles of the internet, my name is Adriana and today I'm here to bring you part one of my May wrap up. I have never done my wrap ups in parts and I don't intend on making this a habit, but I'm on track to read so many books for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month that to put them all in one video would be an attack on my future self. So let's get into the first five books I read in May and by extension my Asian readathon progress. The first book I finished in May was a buddy read I did with my friend Melissa and that was for The Matchmakers List by Sonia Lali. This is an own voices contemporary romance story about an Indian Canadian character named Reina whose grandmother has raised her and now wants nothing more than to see her married to a good Indian husband of course. But now that Reina is pushing 30 her grandmother sees her age as a ticking clock and with Reina's best friend's upcoming wedding ceremony finding Reina a suitable husband becomes her grandmother's main focus. She begins scouting every eligible Indian man within a 30 mile radius and compiles a list of potential suitors, and she fully intends to make sure that Reina goes on every single date. So the question becomes, can Reina find the courage to voice what she really wants, and among this dating frenzy can she somehow actually find romance? This story is interesting because it addresses a very specific divide between culture and individual identity. How are those things distinct, and where do they intersect? You see how much love Reina has for her culture and for the traditions that come from that culture, but also how the need for an arranged marriage makes her feel like she's broken in a sense because the implication is that she can't find love for herself. And also being on the market is an incredibly public thing in her community which means everybody has to have their say and everyone feels the right to comment, which sucks. It's a push and pull because tradition can definitely be comforting and validating, but it can also feel restricting at times. Ultimately, I feel like this story is less of a romance than you would expect because it's more about a reclamation of agency on Reina's part. She's finally asking herself, what is it that she wants? Does she want to find love and get married because that's what she has always wanted or because that would mean everyone else's happiness? And is the happiness of other people the equivalent of her own happiness? I feel like she's learning to distinguish between what she wants and and what is wanted for her, which is a very hard line to draw, especially when culture and tradition are in the mix. That's kind of where this book let me down because Reina is realizing that she does value love and romance and that she does want to find someone who loves her completely and absolutely and I think the relationship this story was building up in order to fulfill that could have used a lot more development. Also something that bothered me was that at one point Reina pretends to be queer just to get her nani off her back. And that went on for much longer than I thought it would, which sucks considering that it's pretty messed up to appropriate an experience that's extremely difficult, especially for queer Indian folks, and to make light of it in a sense just to catch a break. It is somewhat addressed by some side queer characters in the story, but because it went on for so long, it just felt like too little too late. That said, this was a really sweet, empowering romance story that had a lot to say about self-discovery and finding value in yourself, but it did have its issues, which is why I gave it three stars. Shortly afterwards, as promised, was the audiobook of Ruse by Cindy Pond, read by Roger Ye and Kim My Guest. This is the sequel to Want, which is an own voices Taiwanese sci-fi story about a group of misfits orchestrating an elaborate techno heist. In this futuristic Taipei, pollution has become so prominent that it's basically become a source of physical illness. In response to that, society has divided itself into two classes, yo's and mei's. To be yo is to have. These are the rich, privileged, upper class folks who have access to these high tech bio suits. And to be mei is to want. And simply put, they do not have the same access. Jason Zhao is Mei, and he and his friends are trying to infiltrate Jin Corp, the corrupt manufacturer of these suits, to level the playing field a bit. And this installment explores what happens after the heist. Let me just say, I have really enjoyed both Want and Ruse. They're both exhilarating sci-fi stories that combine technology, social consciousness, and high-octane heists in really interesting ways. When I'm in the stories, I'm extremely invested, and I want to know what happens next. I would recommend both of these books to anyone in a heartbeat because they're super badass. But there's something about these stories that just falls short for me by the end, and I think after reading Ruse, I finally figured out what that is. The thing about this duology is that the characters are focused on one mark, on dealing damage to one person, and that is Jin of Jin Corp, who obviously holds the most power and the most resources. Logically, I get it. I understand that dealing a blow to the person on top might trickle down and slowly start affecting other things, but to me, it's not sustainable because it doesn't address the underlying issues. This is a 
society that has allowed pollution and poverty to rise in unprecedented ways. It's a government that values money so much that they've created the demand for gin suits in the first place. What's going on is deeply systematic. We're not talking about the people Jin employs, all the people who have killed and stolen and swindled in his name because that speaks to something even bigger at stake. I feel like this society is so corrupt and damaged in so many ways that getting rid of Jin would just be like cutting the head off a hydra. Once he's dealt with, so many more corrupt businessmen would be willing to take his place. As I've said before, this duology has some really strong elements. It has great characters such as Ling Yi, who's on the cover of this book, who partially narrates this book, and who's also queer. It has action, it has social commentary, it has romance, and because of that, I would still recommend it. But it does fall short for me in the pursuing a mustachioed villain kind of way, which is why I gave this installment three and a half stars. After that, I finally listened to Dragon Pearl by Yoon Ha Lee, coincidentally also read by Kim My Guest. This is a middle grade sci-fi space opera adventure story and because it's firmly rooted in Korean culture and mythology, it is also own voices. Our protagonist Min and her entire family have fox magic which allows them to charm and shapeshift, but Min's mother has forbidden any of them from using that magic. Min has always wanted to escape her impoverished home planet and follow in her brother Jun's footsteps by joining the elite space forces. Then word comes back that Jun has been branded a traitor who's abandoned his post in search of the mythical dragon pearl a powerful magical object that has the power to transform and terraform entire planets. Mean realizes that this sounds nothing like June, so she sets off to impersonate a Space Forces cadet so that she can figure out the truth behind these fabrications. Let me start by saying that Yoon Ha Lee is a genius, and the way he's adapted his unique, distinctive voice to fit a middle grade demographic is pitch perfect. This story is action-packed and sporadic from start to finish, and considering how this story stands on its own, I was very impressed by the epic scope of this book. First of all, I love that Yoon Ha Lee throws out these concepts about gender that are inherently queer and subversive and then makes them such a normal, inconsequential part of each book. For example, there's a brief discussion about how fox spirits can choose their gender or change their gender at certain points in their lives, and there's also a major supporting character who goes by gender-neutral address. Not to mention the thing that no one talks about, which is that in order for Mean to impersonate a Space Forces cadet, she has to disguise herself and use fox magic to pass as a male space cadet. Again, this is positioned as a very normal part of the story and maybe even the least interesting part of the book since there's so much going on around Mean, and I love it for that. We need to see these things as normal parts of life, as decidedly non-issues. But putting that aside, I love Mean so much. She's curious and rebellious, she takes action first and asks questions later. If she even asks questions at all, she dives headfirst into everything she does and she tries so hard to take care of everything herself. I think that was a big part of this story because after Mean runs away from home, she uses magic to fix all of her problems and she has to tell new lies to cover up her old lies and she has to use even more magic to make people believe those lies. And I feel like she's realizing both personally and magically there are limits. And along the way she meets this little found family who want nothing more than to support her and help her discover the truth, which is really important. This story is full of adventure, it's funny, it's heartwarming, it's thoughtful, it's ambitious, and it's completely on brand with all of Yoon Ha Lee's other work, which is why I gave it four stars. Then somewhat on a whim, I picked up When Dimple Met Rishi by Sandhya Manan, read by Vikas Adam and Sineha Matan. This is a delightful own voices YA romance about two Indian American teens, Dimple and Rishi, whose parents are arranging for them to meet, but only one of them knows about it. Dimple is ready to get away from her overbearing parents who insist that she find a good Indian husband at college. Instead, she's getting ready to attend the web developing program of her dreams over summer break. She was surprised when her parents agreed to let her go in the first place, but she's deeply unsettled when she meets Rishi Patel, the hopeless romantic who firmly believes their traditional parents know what's best and who's totally on board for this potential marriage arrangement. So does Dimple reject him outright, or does she give Rishi Patel a chance? I was pleasantly surprised by how wonderful and romantic this story is. Sort of similarly to the matchmakers list, this story is also about modern characters confronting the tradition of arranged marriage and whether that particular tradition is something they personally value or not. I think there's this idea that tradition means doing things the exact same way they've always been done in the past. But this story challenges that by showing this concept that is deeply traditional and cultural, but throwing that to characters who are able to find elements of joy and discovery within that tradition for themselves. 
it was a really refreshing story because both Dimple and Rishi air out their grievances right away and make it clear that they are not on the same page with this. But there's still a chemistry between them and because they're able to temporarily put their family's expectations aside, they're more free to explore that. And it was just great to see these characters fall in love because they're so different. But that difference just means they both have something to offer the other person in terms of growth, which I appreciate. And I think it shows that tradition is what you make of it. You see these characters realizing, actually, no, this is our life and we get to decide what we keep and what matters to us. I think there's acceptance and validation there because they're also realizing that it's not a bad thing to value your family or to respect your parents and your traditions, but you also have to leave room for yourself to exist within that. Plus there's consensual sex in this book and that rocks. I just have so much love for this cute, joyful romance and I can't wait to read all of Sandhya Manan's other books. I gave this one four stars. And the last book I want to discuss today is A River in Darkness by Masaji Ishikawa, translated by Martin Brown and Risa Kobayashi, read by Brian Nishi. This is an interesting memoir because Masaji Ishikawa is half Korean and half Japanese, and while he was born in Japan, it was during a difficult time when the war between Japan and Korea had just subsided, and in the wake of that, his family didn't really have a place. His father was uneducated, he was violent, he was a South Korean nationalist, and eventually he was lured to North Korea by the promise of work, opportunity, and a higher social class. But when they got to North Korea, Masaji's family was still seen as outcasts, and they suffered greatly under this totalitarian regime, as you may have guessed. Eventually, as the subtitle suggests, he did barely escape North Korea with his life. Trigger warnings for alcoholism, violence, domestic abuse, harsh living conditions, starvation, and brief descriptions of a suicide attempt. The subtitle of this book is One Man's Escape from North Korea, and I have to say that's exactly what this is. It's very focused on this single experience, which is totally valid, and I have to say I was impressed by how emotional and introspective this account turned out to be, especially considering that it was translated from Japanese. Masaji Ishikawa is extremely open about his family life, and I feel like he has a lot to say on the phenomenon of placelessness. I think this is a great piece to put in conversation with Pachinko by Min Jin Lee because there's a lot of commentary about being treated as a second-class citizen in your own country and always being positioned as less. When you read through this account, it almost makes sense why Masaji's father was drawn to North Korea in the first place. They faced unimaginable hardships in Japan and they didn't really have a place, but then there's this country saying, we will accept any Koreans looking for a citizenship, we will give you a place to live, we will give you sustainable work and restore your sense of dignity and purpose. There's a part in this memoir when Masaji himself is getting a membership card for the Youth League, which he only took part in to help his family status, and he's looking at the words on this card that say, you protect the values of socialism, and the sense of purpose instilled in those words almost made him believe it. It is powerful when you feel alone and abandoned, not only by your fellow citizens, but by your government and your country, to have an institution that makes you feel like your existence is valued in a very specific way. This was an incredibly insightful, evocative memoir that shows a true snapshot of what life in North Korea was like in the late 80s and 90s, and it made me realize that I would definitely like to read more memoirs like this because they are tremendously important. Ultimately, I gave this memoir four stars. So those are just the first five books I read in May. In the second part of this wrap-up, you can look forward to my thoughts on Descendant of the Crane, The Bride Test, and a few more exciting books, so definitely keep an eye out for that. As always, if you've read any of these books yourself, I would love to discuss in the comments. But that's everything I have for this wrap-up today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you on the flip side of the page. Bye!